Now, we have a number of cases that we're going to hear oral argument on today, and the first one is going to be Given versus uh, Worldway. It's case number 21 CA 011791. As you can see, the uh, panel will be Judge Hensel on my right, Judge Sutton on my left. I'll be the presiding judge, uh, keeping track of time. Each of you will have 15 minutes to present your argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. And if you let me know how much time you wish to reserve, if any, I'll uh, keep track of that. I may interrupt you just to let you know how much time you have left, and you can make a decision either to continue or, or to stop at that point. Um, as you know, the arguments are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, so we ask that you stay at the podium and keep your voice up. Uh, court has a rule that we do not use the names of children, minors, or victims during the argument to them as the child or by initial, if appropriate, in your argument. I think that's all the preliminaries I have to go over. I, I can tell you that uh, Judge Hensel, just son, Judge Sutton, and I have read the briefs, and we are prepared to proceed if you are. Would you like to reserve some time? I would like to reserve five minutes, please. All right, and I'll let you know as you get close. Thank you. All right. Court Counsel, my name is Mary Avalm and I represent Worldway Corporation in this case. As you can see, <clears throat> and I'll apologize for my voice, these allergies have gotten me completely destroyed. But um, as you can see from this case, this is our appeal from the order of the trial court on August 10, 2021, which agreed to further allow Ms. Gibbons' claim for a number of conditions, right sided neural animal stenosis and substantial aggravation of pre-existing C5-6 degenerative disc disease, both of which are degenerative progressive conditions. I know you know the facts of this case. I just want to highlight one thing. Ms. Gibbon had been an employee of Worldway Corporation since 1995, and during that period of her time, her job really never changed. She was doing essentially the same job and continues to do that same job as she testified in the trial court. At the close of plaintiff's Case, we filed a motion for a directed verdict, which the judge did not grant. We also submitted the jury instruction, which the judge did not give. We are appealing based upon the fact that we did not feel that Ms. Gibbon had presented evidence which complies with Ohio law in proving a progressive injury. And we believe that the court should have directed the verdict and, and or should have given the instruction we requested. This case is presented as an injury case a gradually progressing injury disease or a case as opposed to an occupational disease. An occupational disease for workers' compensation purposes is something like asbestosis, silicosis, something that develops over the time of the injured worker's work history. And sometimes they don't even know they have it until well after they've stopped working. Occupational diseases also include things like repetitive trauma, like carpal tunnel syndrome, lateral epicondylitis, those kinds of things, which again occur as, as a result of repetitive trauma. And just a, a bit of background on what we call village injuries. <clears throat> Prior to 1984, in Ohio, you had to prove that there was a specific event, incident, or something actually happened before you could have a claim allowed for an injury. In 1984, however, the Ohio Supreme Court decided the case of Village versus General Motors, and that's why we refer to them as village cases. And in those cases, uh, in this case, uh, Mr. Village had been assigned to a new position, installing batteries. The batteries weighed anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds, and he did that job for five days and developed a backache. The next day he woke up, he could not get out of bed. He immediately went to the emergency room, he received treatment, and the Ohio Supreme Court basically said in that case that in that kind of a situation where you had a new job assignment, it was substantially different than what you had been doing before over a certain period of time, that the claim could be allowed as an injury claim versus an occupational disease. Since that time, there, there are not a ton of cases on this issue, but the case law that we have found, and which is cited in our brief, suggests that this kind of a developing injury has to occur over a finite period of time. In the village case, it was a period of five days. The terms relatively narrow, discernible, and not remote have been used in some of the cases. Counsel? Did Village define discernible period of time? No, it did not. No. 
there was a dissent in that case which indicated that it was uh, required to be uh, a discernible time which is reasonably definite and, definite and not remote. That was in a dissenting opinion from Judge Holmes, but in the case itself, that is as close as we get to what a discernible period of time is. There is a recent case which I'm gonna discuss in just a second, uh, which is Day versus Rockley Plastic. And in that case, it's one of the few cases that are actually available to us in terms of trying to define what a discernible period of time is. In that case, there was a specific event that occurred on the date of the injury. Ms. Day had had some ongoing problems, but on the date of that incident, there was a specific event which occurred. That is not present in this case. As indicated, Ms. Gibbons' testimony, as well as her doctor's testimony, confirmed that there was no event, and her employment did not change, as I indicated. She admitted to having ongoing pain for years and years, and on the date that was listed as the date of injury, it was a just a day she said, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore, and she went and reported this. But there was nothing specific that happened, unlike what happened today. This was just a day when she decided. Counsel, are you talking about that day, um, the date in uh, early 2018, so Correct. January 2018? Correct. Is there anything in the, uh, in the record um, about her having uh, a pain prior to that? Beyond, you know, is there any kind of documentary evidence? Or? Her testimony at trial court indicated that she had been on, having ongoing pain for years. And then in 2018, early 2018, she indicated, I can't, something I just, to the effect, I can't take I'm it tired anymore. Of doing this, I, I'm tired of this pain, and so she went and reported it. That's correct. Thank you. Her doctor's testimony, which was obviously crucial in terms of her presenting medical evidence, uh, specifically said that his discernible period of time was the 25 plus years of her appointment with Workland. And that is the most he ever said in terms of trying to narrow it down. And at one other place at page, uh, volume one, 181, and at page 28 of his deposition transcript, he admitted there was no event and said basically, this was over the whole time of her appointment with Worldaway. I thought the medical records indicated that the pain arose in that January, January period of time. The plant, the, uh, her testimony actually was that it had been an ongoing problem for years. Uh, as I indicated, in the, in the Day versus Rockland case, the, as I read the case, the court decided that Ms. Day was able to participate in workers' compensation because there was a specific event. And the case specifically said, and I'm quoting here, that she experienced a sharp pain in her shoulder while she was scooping resin during the early part of her shift. The pain was severe and prompted her to go to the Euclid emergency room. After being treated there, she also followed up with the doctor. The doctor's case also said that, uh, in that day case, that on the day of the injury, a more definitive acute event occurred that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So the doctor and the injured worker both in the day case confirmed that there was a specific event, and that is uh, what kind of led to the filing of the claim. Counsel and Day, did uh, uh, the um, individual scoop resin before? Was that part of the ordinary course of the... I do not know that. All I know is they refer to this as a specific event, both by the expert and the trial court referred to as it as an event. In this case, uh, Ms. Given did not go to the hospital. There is no indication that there was any change in her condition from the day before she reported it to the day after it. She did not seek immediate treatment. She simply came in and said, my arm's hurting, it's been hurting. And her testimony confirmed that and confirmed that nothing specific happened. In the day case, uh, the court cited a number of cases which we believe are instructive as to what a discernible time means. They quoted, as I indicated, the dissent in the village case they also talked about the Williams versus LTD case, which indicates, uh, and I'm quoting here, had not shown that the injury had taken place over a discernible period of time, only that her condition had developed some time while in the employee of the defendant. That is pretty much what Dr. Bennett has said in this case. There is a case entitled Miller versus Emory Oil, which
language that we also cited, which refers to, again, an ascertainable period of time. And in K versus Mem, there is a statement specifically that the village case allows for progressive and gradually developing injuries, but the rule has its limits. The disability must relate to, relate to a discernible period of time, which is reasonably, de reasonably definite and not remote. Those are the let, cases let that we have been able to find which suggest... Go ahead and finish, then I have a question. Okay. That suggest that there has to be a finite period of time for this to develop, not simply in the course and scope of one's 25 plus years on the job. Yes, sir. So, factually, it looks like the uh, motion for the additional allowance was for cervical strain, stenosis, and the degenerative disc disease. And my question is, uh, we don't get deeply, deeply into the record uh, prior to argument, but is there any medical history of uh, neck injuries or stenosis prior to uh, the 2018 date? There is no medical evidence of any specific injury to that body, to those bodies. All right. You've got about 16 seconds left before you're ready to your uh, rebuttal time. So okay. Use I, I would just note rebuttal. at this point, we have did an exhaustive search, and I'm sure that opposing counsel did also. We have not found a single case that suggests that the criteria for establishing a village-type injury is any different than what has been stated in the decisions, even though some of those cases, the specific ruling wasn't on that issue. But the only cases that have addressed that issue, from what I have found, indicate that the Ohio law is that it must occur in a reasonably short period of time. All right, thank you. You'll have four minutes and 44 seconds for your rebuttal. You'll we'll have 15 minutes. Great. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court, Louis Grube of Flowers and Grube here on behalf of the plaintiff appellee, Tamara Given. I'm joined by my co-counsel, Melissa Grice. Um, uh, may it please the court. Uh, Appellant Whirlaway is wrong on the facts and the law in this case, and this court could affirm for either or both reasons. There's no requirement under the law for a plaintiff to demonstrate a discernible period of time for an acute event or a uh, progressive injury separate from just a regular old injury as defined under Revised Code 4123.01c. But even under Whirlaway's view of the law, an appellate court should not interfere if a worker testifies that her injury arose during a specific seven-month period if a physician confirms that this injury arises from her work and jurors choose to believe her. With that record and no countervailing evidence, an instruction on a discernible period of time would not have been warranted even if it were actually written into the law. Um, I'd like to start in on a question that Judge Sutton, you had asked, and Judge Theodosio, you had followed up. Uh, I want to clear up the record here. There's definitely evidence in this case that Ms. Gibbon had been working for 25 years, but she, at least as far as we can tell from our review of the transcript, she did not testify in this case that she'd been feeling pain for years. Uh, on page 147 of the transcript, she was very clear that she had been experiencing pain in this instance for the five months preceding the July date on which she raised this issue to her employer and when she was directed by her employer to go seek medical help for this injury. Um, that's essential, because uh, essentially Worlaway's position here is that the 25 years of work, which ultimately led to and contributed to this injury, is the same as the injury. And this court should make it very clear that the injury here is the symptoms, the feeling she was experiencing in her arm, the tingling in her fingers uh, on both sides, the radiating pain down her right arm. Ultimately, the condition here is stenosis, which is a narrowing of the foraminal pathway that the nerves go down in the spine. That is the condition here. And there was no evidence in this case that this was a medically existing injury before that January 2018 period when she started feeling, feeling her injury. Um, so I wanted to very carefully clean that up. Uh, the, some important facets of the law here. First of all, um, opposing counsel has this definition of a progressive injury that I, I don't want the court to get 
um, tied up in that because even in the reply brief, it's admitted that progressive injury is not defined separately in the revised code. I mean, that's page two, I think, of their reply brief. There's no separate definition for progressive injury. And while maybe the case law treats it somewhat differently, and even we would disagree with that, the statute doesn't. So for this court, without any binding authority in this area to make a decision, ultimately the guidestone should be the statute. The statute just defines injury. There is a separate definition for um, um, uh, substantial aggravation of an injury, but even that was met here. You know, there's no argument that that wasn't met. So we're just in regular definition of injury, revised code 4123.01c. As a baseline, this court should simply apply the plain text of that statute, as courts are required to do in Ohio. Um, also, finite period of time. Uh, council agreed. Village did not define that. This actually, if you read closely the day case, this, the finite period of time or, or um, discernible period of time, this is from a concurrence by Justice Holmes. Uh, if it had had the force of law, it would have garnered a majority, and it didn't. So what's the law in Ohio? The law in Ohio is that there's no necessity for an acute event. I'd ask the court to closely listen to council's arguments about an acute event, because Defendant Worlaway is willing to admit that there is no such requirement for an acute event after the village case was decided, but then in their analysis of the day case, they, they narrowly focus on the fact that they see an acute event in that case. I'd like to get into the day case because this court should simply apply the same logic that the day case did. In, in day, the motion for uh, motion for judgment as a matter of law after the plaintiff's case and after the close of evidence was denied, and the court affirmed that. You know, we would ask for the same result in this case as in day, and if this court wants to take that same pathway as day did, that's fine. But ultimately, we are here asking for this court to affirm day did that. If it's analogous, I don't know how you can read day and come to a different result on such similar facts. And I'd like to go into the similarities on the facts. In Day, uh, this was a repetitive work injury that grew over eight years of, of labor. Uh, only, only after those eight years of labor did this injury grow to an acute pain on a specific day. There wasn't a specific incident causing this injury, but there was a day where the acute pain occurred. And again, as I was explaining before, there's a difference between an acute event causing an injury and the day on which it becomes simply too much. In day, that, that was a specific day, and all of the stuff about a discernible period of time coming out of the Holmes Concurrence and Village, you could actually take that out of the day case and come to the same result, because the law doesn't require that. But there was enough evidence in day to establish causation, and that is ultimately why the Court of Appeals affirmed the judgment in that case. And they relied on Village and Miller uh, in day to explain how cases can be different. So, for example, or sorry, Miller and Williams. Miller is a uh, 12th district case, Williams an 8th district case. In Miller, there was rheumatoid arth arthritis, which uh, the evidence showed sort of pops up. It's, it's, there's no way to specifically demonstrate a cause. I, I, I'm forgetting the technical term they used for it in, in the case, but um, it sort of just appears, and we don't necessarily know why it's caused in any given case. But the bigger problem in that case is that there was no way to tie it to the work specifically. It wasn't clear whether it had happened in the preceding month, whether it had happened in the 18 years that the injured worker had worked at, at her place of employment. And so there was no way to decide, okay, was this actually related to the work? Unlike that case, we have here that the injury cropped up in a specific period of time. We have a doctor saying that it was related to the work. That should be enough for this court to affirm. In the was her testimony that uh, she had just couldn't take the pain any longer? As in, I've been doing this for 25 years, and, and then in this this job was just too painful. Or was it, you know, um, man, I've tried to work through this since January, and I can't do it anymore. Thank you, Your Honor. It was the latter. Uh, I point you to pages 146 and 147 of the transcript, where she's answering the exact question, how long did this pain occur? She said five months, and described it as the kind of thing where she couldn't take it any longer, so she went to talk to management. Um, 
I can't remember the specific page, but I know that there are references in the record, and I think we cite them in our brief and explain them in, in this way. There are specific references in the record. She was actually working on gauging parts, so she has to take the parts out of the box, put them on a table, and then put them up next to some sort of like um, some sort of equipment that measures the shape and size of these parts. And as she was doing that, she simply couldn't do it any longer. She Am I correct in that there's no medical history of uh, these January injuries uh, pre-existing? Yes, Your Honor. There's absolutely no medical evidence that these injuries existed before January 2018. What about employment records where she complained about a similar pain? I saw nothing like that in the record. Um, but even if there were, I mean, that still comes down to a question of fact that the jury can sort out. You when, know, if there's countervailing evidence on both sides, this court should affirm. When, when was the degenerative disc disease diagnosed? It was diagnosed, uh, all, of the, all the medical diagnosis and treatment happened after the July 2018 date on which she had gone and spoken to management about how she was feeling. And the conclusion is, is that the job that she had aggravated substantially, in terms substantially aggravated, yeah. the um, degenerative disc disease that had just been diagnosed. Yes, Your Honor. The, the, te the medical testimony, the stenosis cropped up more, more recently under the medical testimony, but the medical testimony did recognize that uh, the degenerative disc disease is something that comes up over a longer period of time. It's just there's actually no evidence that it existed before January 2018. And so there is, even, even if this court accepts Worldaway's view of the law, which again, we disagree with, the evidence is still there. I, and I'd like to pivot to that for a moment. We still have a discernible period of time. This is not narrowly defined. It doesn't have to be a week. It just has to be a period of weeks or months. That's, e even if you accept that that's the law and you read the day case in the favorable way that defendant Worldaway has asked for, we still meet that standard. The 8th District said weeks or months. We have five to seven months, depending on which part of the transcript you cite to, and the jury was well within their bailiwick on the evidence here to determine that it was, in fact, evidence you know, evidence of an actual injury cropping up during a discernible period of time. So then the question becomes this jury instruction. A jury instruction should be given if there's some evidence supporting a conclusion in favor of the party that's asking for it under that jury instruction. And there's simply no countervailing evidence here that it cropped up further back or, or you know, a longer period of time, more than five or seven months prior. So it's, it's not really clear to me even what a jury would have done with that instruction had it been given to them. And ultimately, it probably just would have been confusing. Because the jury instruction they're asking for is that the, quote, the plaintiff must also present evidence demonstrating a causal connection between the injury and the work-related duties taking place over a discernible period of time. The only testimony on the period of time is that symptoms cropped up in January of 2018, and she reported the injury in July of 2018. So that's discernible. I'm guessing there was some dispositive motion practice prior to this going to trial? This went to trial without summary judgment. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I, uh, I would conclude. I've said everything I came to say. So if there are no further questions, uh, we'd ask the court to affirm. All right, thank you. Attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. And Attorney Ohm, you've got the four minutes and 44 seconds. Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the Day case. As I read that case, the only reason that the court allowed that claim to be allowed was because there was an acute event. When you read their uh, analysis of the other cases, the Williams case, the Cave case, they suggest, again, that they believed that there had to be a finite period of time. And the reason they decided to allow that was because there was an event that broke the, camp, that broke the camel's back, the straw that broke the camel's back. So I disagree with the opposing counsel regarding the analysis today. I, I think that supports our position in this case, that in fact, without any kind of specific event occurring on the date of the injury, it did not satisfy the criteria for the occupational disease. And what we have here is no expert testimony, which is required by the uh, plaintiff, no expert testimony that defines this injury within any kind of a reasonable period of time. If you look at Dr. Bennett's testimony, Dr. Bennett specifically said it was 25 years of working and her 20 plus years of work, the entire time she was working at Worldwide. So there is no expert testimony that actually satisfies the criteria in the village. 
I do understand the statute, but you must understand that village was a is a kind of injury that was not statutorily defined. It was a creation of the Ohio Supreme Court in 1984, because prior to that time, there was no such thing as a gradually developing injury. So the village case is still definitive as to the kind of injury that's being presented here today, because as I said, there was no specific event. We Council, believe that what Council, um, help me with this, because um, in, in reading village, um, isn't it accurate that the worker in village suffered the injury over uh, the course of only five days, but the village court did not place a limitation on the time period of the gradual work-related injury, um, how, what, what that had to be in order to be compensable? Well, there was no ability really for them to do that. They, were, they were, had a case in front of them that was five days, and they said that a gradually developing injury in that case was appropriate. They did not define it, and there was no reason for them to do that. But if you look at the other cases that have been cited, those the cases- The Supreme Court has not done that. That is correct. Thank you. We believe, however, that if you affirm this case, this would be a substantial change in Ohio law. Currently, as workers' comp practitioners, we rely on the fact that the case law supports there has been, needs to be a relatively narrow, defined period where something specific happens, somebody's uh, condition changes within a specific limited period of time, they get medical treatment, that's not what occurred in this case. We believe this, as I said, is, is a substantial change in Ohio law, and without the expert testimony needed to define and, and narrow the time period, because as I said, all Dr. Bennett said was during her entire period of work at, at Worldway. That's the expert testimony that's been presented. We do not believe that that satisfies the criteria, and accordingly, we are asking you to vacate the trial order and remand for directions to issue a directed verdict or set to schedule a trial. I uh, do have a, a question about the jury instruction. Was that um, actually proffered into the record? It was, yes. Okay. So I will find that in the record? I believe it would. I, I noted my objections on uh, to it uh, to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Is there are no other questions? And I, uh, okay. All right. I want to thank you both thank you. for you. excellent presentations. Very interesting case. We'll take it under advisement and uh, issue a decision in due course. Each of you will be mailed a copy of the decision on the day it's released. And as you probably know, the uh, opinions are also posted on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website. Uh, again, thank you for your presentations and have a great day.